Welcome to Christ Life Ministries. Then they said, no, 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 don't wear it that way. That's not the way they are wearing it now. So I asked them, I said, who are these they? There's somewhere I don't want to go, but I will go. And then I'll quickly come back. You know, the way they wear their hair these days, they don't comb it. So it looks like the hair of a madman. If you can't say amen, say, oh, me. <laughs> then you follow them. So that you be like the people of the earth. Why would a person allow his hair to match together and become so unkempt and now it becomes a style? And you see all the young people, even the born again Christians, even some of the pastors. They do it so that they can attract that kind of crowd. You know, you find pastors. I didn't want to go here, but I've gone there. I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm flowing with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the heart of the king is as the rivers of water. And he turns it with us wherever he will. <laughs> so I'm flowing. I wear hair. It is mad men. Have you seen the man on the road? The after weeks and days of not having their bath and not combing their hair, then the hair becomes unkempt. And you now wear that kind of hair. Are you trying to attract the same spirit that makes men mad? No, no, you have to ask. It's a serious question. That's what you will attract. It's not a style. It's like the other nations. Just want to flow with the crowd. You see, you know, when they do their hair now, they will leave this place, plenty of hair. Then this place, they will take the, this one off. They will take this place off. I thought you she one wearing. <laughs> Hello. You know where they got it from? The Red Indians. You take this part off. Take that part, then you leave the middle. The reason why God removed the Red Indians from the land of America and brought the founding fathers from America is the same reason why He removed the Amalekites, the, the Jebusites from the land of Canaan and brought in the prison of Israel. And He wanted, if you do the same thing they do, I will remove you just like I removed them. Because they were worshiping evil spirits, killing themselves. Same thing now. You want to go and start wearing a madman's hair. You call it fashion. Don't be like the people of the world. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. They are not of the Father, but of the world. Love not the world. Look decent. Let all things be done decently and in order. Not unkempt. I went there and I'm coming back. <laughs> Amen. I got a tweet. Go back to the scripture, Deuteronomy 17. Don't do those things. Don't, don't, don't do them. I don't know if you, whether you know or not, but I'm going to tell you. Judgment is coming. And if your children try and do that thing, rebuke them. They'll be on record. You know, my children don't go there. When they do anything, I'll say, mm -mm, I won't, don't do that. Don't do it. Don't just because that's what they are doing. Who are the they? It's the world. Instead of allowing the world to dictate the pace, why don't we dictate the pace? Let the world become like us instead of us become like the world. A clap offering for the Lord. I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. Be very careful about that. Trying to do things like everybody's doing. Find out what God is doing. Then do God's own. Not like what other people are doing. Next verse. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren. Thou shalt set king over thee. Thou mayest not say a stranger. You know it has to be a person of Israel. Next verse. 
But he, I didn't hear you, shall not multiply horses to himself. I didn't hear you. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt. To the end that he should multiply horses. The purpose for going to Egypt is to get more material things. He's just using horses here as a type. You know, as an example. That's the purpose. And that's, do you know the same thing is happening in the church today? This, the, in order to get more material things, we, be, we go back to behaving like we used to do before we got born again. This Bible. To the end, since that's the purpose, that he may multiply horses. That's why he wants to go back to Egypt. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. That is not just for the people. It's, it's, to, it's still applicable today. I'm not talking to anybody here. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. I wish Solomon had read the scripture more. Got the, both Solomon and David disobeyed the scripture. Both of them. D David disobeyed it before he became king. He was only, can you imagine? A boy told it, he's not yet 30. He became 30 when he was king. He, was, he became king when he was 30. Well, in the wilderness, he already had three wives. <sighs> Don't let me go there. I'm going to come back there later because I'm talking about David, maybe not today. That his heart, now look at God. That his heart turn not away. You know what? If you if you if you indulge in some of these things, your heart will turn. Solomon, what's he gonna do? Of Solomon later on, his heart turned. Whom the Lord had appeared to twice. It doesn't matter how much revelation you have. It doesn't matter how close you have walked with God. If you start disobeying these things, your heart can turn. Neither shall he greatly multiply. I didn't hear you. To himself silver and gold. Observe the key word here is to himself. God has promised he's going to bless us. So the gold and silver will multiply. But the problem is if you start using it for yourself alone. You know, selfishness, you know, self-indulgence. Eh? Come to my house now and you see... A flotilla of uh, 20 cars. Mm. And this Olubi J, he likes cars. Remember when I was a kid, you know, I'm talking about my teenage years. I used to, you know, look at Maserati, you know, BMW. Watch, you know, how much was the acceleration between 0 and 60. The one that can do 7 seconds, the one that can do 5.1 seconds. I still, up till today, I still like cars. There's nothing wrong with a nice car. But what do you want to do with 20? There's something wrong with you. I don't know. This is the Holy Ghost too. All these places, they're not in the notes. <laughs> I'm just branching. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him. Observe the word is he, 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 not they, they, they. This is something personal that God wants the king to do for himself. A copy of this law in a book, out of which is before the priests and the Levites. In other words, every king of Israel was supposed to have a personal copy. Of God's word. Not the whole thing, but the key things like love the Lord thy God and all of these things. You know? And keep it. And it shall be with him. His personal copy. Not the one that is inside the temple. In those days they had scrolls. So the main Bible would be inside the temple with the Levites and the priests. But God said, take from that one that is in the temple, make a copy of these essential parts. The weightier matters of the law. And keep that personal copy with you. 
that he will read there in some of the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Observe, the fear of God is something that you learn. It's not automatic. That's why if you say it every day, you pray it every day, then gradually your heart begins to get it. Hello? Next verse. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. That he turn not aside from the commandment to the right and to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Let's get back. What God, this was the thing about David that God liked. Before David ever became king, he was practicing this. First Samuel 16, 1. Quickly. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reign over Israel? Why? Because this thing, Saul didn't do it. He started like this. That was why he was chosen at first. But when he became king, he was so busy becoming king, being king, he didn't have time for the God who made him king anymore. So his heart, what the Bible said, began, began to be lifted up among the brethren. You know, he became, he started, that's how he started growing proud, rebellious, stubborn. And that's why this after about, you know, many years, that's why God rejected him. Fill thy horn with oil and go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. We know the story. I'm not going to cause of time. Quickly go to verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. But the Lord. See, they brought all the boys. Samuel had, uh, Jesse had eight sons. So they brought seven of them. So he looked at the first one. He was just like Saul. Tall. And, 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 and he was going to, and God said, he said, mm, I've rejected him. And the Lord said unto Samuel, I didn't hear you. Look not on his countenance. Let's say New Testament language, judge not according to appearance. We still do the same thing today. Many of us are guilty of this. I've been guilty of it in the past. We judge things by appearance. Ah, that man, he has a big church. He has a nice car. He has this. Ah, ah, God must be with him. Who told you? <laughs> this is a joke. I'm just going to say, I've said it here in church recently. I remember one guy, this was many, many years ago. I think the year was 1988, 89, 90, something like that. One pastor, I even saw him recently from afar. I didn't greet him. Not because I didn't want to, but he was far away. So I couldn't see him. You know, I just remembered him. I just chuckled and laughed. He came here. I don't know if Pastor Boyga was with me that day. He came here to the church. This time we had just built this auditorium. And then we had this nice wood, um, wooden roof that was very polished, very nice. You know. So he now came. You know, he looked. He said, ah, so alone, only moving bad or no. <laughs> we just burst into laughter. The reason why all of them are going to Lagos was because there's no money in Ibadan. Ibadan is a civil service town. There are no industries. There are no big banks and all of that. All that started happening recently, you know. So most of them, because of money, they went to Lagos. So when he came and he saw what God had had mercy on us to do here. He said, so alone only in our language, that means so God can move in Ibadan too. Judging according to appearance. None the high of I have refused him. Because, I didn't hear you. I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the Lord looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Give the Lord a super clap offering. This is why 
David was chosen. Acts chapter 13 verse 22 he said, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart. How did David become like that? Watch this. How did David become like that? And his brothers not. They went to the same synagogue. They grew up in the same Bethlehem. Their daddy was the same. They were taught the same Bible. What made the difference between David and his brothers? David would speak God's word every day. He, he wasn't a king yet, but he had started practicing the things that kings do. When he would go to the wilderness with the sheep, you know, looking after the sheep and all that, he would be, that's where he got Psalm 23 from. The Lord is my shepherd, looking at how he looks after the sheep and all of that. that that's what made David, and he had already started practicing those things. And so his heart had come in love with God, to, to, to love God more. That was why God chose him. Not because Eliab was tall or short. It had nothing to do with it. Not only the physical appearance. It was the heart. And you need to understand that. Look at uh, uh, Acts chapter 13 verse 22. Acts. Acts. Yes. And when he removed and he raised up David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, I have found. Observe say, I have found. Scream it. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means God was looking for. You don't find except you are looking for. It means this type of heart is a rare heart. That's why the eyes of the Lord are running to and through the earth. Because most people's hearts are not like that. I have found. You know, I've been looking. I have now found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will fulfill all my will. How did God know before David become king? Because it had become David's practice. So God trusted that when he became king, he would not derail. And gladly, David didn't derail. Hmm. I just got a tweet. You know what he said? Train up a child in the way in which he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. David had been like that from when he was young. He had exercised, watch this, his heart in righteous practices. So God knew that when he's old, he won't depart. That's why he chose him. At this time, he was only 17 years old. 17, 18. Because he couldn't go to war with the, brother, with the brothers. Now, one of the things, there, there, there are certain key things in David's life. I don't know if we'll be able to finish it today. If I don't finish it today, we'll pick it up next time. You know, but this is the, these are the key things in David's life. Firstly, he developed a heart for God by keeping the word of God in his heart, saying it with his mouth, you know, and, and, and putting it in his heart and practicing it in his daily life. Now, what gave him, this is not in my notes, but it gave him the supernatural courage to face a lion and a bear. It is unnatural for a 17-year-old boy to face a lion and a bear. Most 17-year-olds will run away or let the, 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 the lion take away the lamb and kill it. But David stood up to a lion and took the, 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 the sheep out of the lion's mouth and smote the lion. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Where did he get that kind of courage from? The word of God. And he'd been doing it when he was still in the wilderness. All these ones, probably his parents didn't know. Just between him and God in the wilderness. So when God wanted to choose a king, he looked for somebody who had been keeping the word of God in their heart and in their mouth. He said, the word is nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. David was a practitioner. He was a doer of God's word. And God was confident that when he comes to the throne, he will continue because he had been training himself that way probably from the age of 12, like Jesus. You know, he's been doing this for years now because when he's old, he won't depart from it. And we know from David, the account of David's life that he did not depart except in the matter of Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, which we'll mention later on. Now, let's, I want to just key in 
some crucial things about David's attitude that made him a success in contrast with Saul and Jonathan that made them a failure as far as fulfillment of destiny is concerned. And God, at the time, Pastor G, listen to this. At the time David did this thing, there was no first Samuel for David to read. David could not turn to the book of first Samuel to go and read it. So you're going to ask the question, where did David, just like Joseph had no Bible, where did David get this kind of wisdom from? God. Because he was keeping God's word in his mouth. He was keeping it in his heart, day and night. So when he was faced with certain tests, even at the time he didn't know it was a test, he refused to kill Saul. This was before he became king. You know, before he was anointed king. God had already pronounced him as king. Had anointed him as king in his father's heart, but he had not become officially king over Israel. Saul was trying to kill him, and David understood a divine principle of divine authority. It's not, it's not explicit in the Old Testament, it's there, it's not explicit. David picked it by revelation, and, uh, and, and the Holy Ghost taught him. And he, 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 he obeyed. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. And <coughs> thank you, Jesus. Chapter 24 and look at verses 1 to 12. And it came to pass. I didn't hear you. When Saul was returned from following the Philistines... I didn't hear you. Saying, behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. These are wonderful names. Next verse. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. You can understand why Jonathan didn't want to go with him. This is not a very comfortable place. Hello? I want to bring out something. This is why you guys need to read your Bible. David at that time had just about 400 men. Three, 400, you know, to 600 men. You know, they keep growing, but it was just a very small number. What will they do against 3,000? The odds were against David. <laughs> Ukraine and Russia. Russia has a bigger army, more soldiers, more guns. But when God is not with you, the little David will, be, will overcome the big Goliath. That's a word just by the side. Next verse. And he came to the sheep coats. That's where sheep, you know, um, stay. Where there was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. That means he went to ease himself. You know, he went to excrete. So what they used to do in those days was that if you feel pressed and you wanted, they didn't have toilets like we have today. So he went into the cave in a private place, took off his skirt, you know, his robe, put it on the side so he could, you know, kneel down, he could, he could bend and he could excrete and ease himself. And David and his men remained. He entered the cave. He didn't realize David and his men were inside that cave. So he was totally defenseless. He was excreting. He had taken his clothes off. He was naked, at least from here down. Next verse. And the men of David, you know, these caves, you know, we went to this place some years ago, uh, Barbados. So one of the tour guides, they took us, they had all these caves that have all these star -like, star, you know, all these um, stalagmites and all of that. So I, I have an idea of what they're talking about. You know, they, they, they are, they're like, you know, um, they have chambers. 
So somebody can be here and another person can be here hiding and he will see you but you won't see him. That's what happened. And the man of David said unto him, our bad boys, behold, the day of which the Lord said to thee, behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. Again, that's why I've taken time to explain it graphically. Saul is easing himself. He's taking his clothes off, he's put it. David and the others are inside the inner part of the cave. Saul cannot see them. But they can see Saul. Then he sees Saul's cloth. So his guys tell him, this is it. today you become king. We kill this guy and that's it. It's all over. You know. So David, listen to them a little bit. You know. So he takes, he, he draws, Saul is still easing himself. He draws the dress, the skirt a little bit, then just cuts off just a little bit, then puts it back. Next verse. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. Give David a super clap offering. No, no, that's not a super one. What a level of spiritual sensitivity. He hadn't killed Saul. Watch this. He was being tempted to kill Saul. And the Holy Ghost rebuked him. Don't try it. So, he, even though he didn't touch Saul, even touching Saul...